I'd like to welcome you to the, this week's uh, meeting of the uh, ERA committee. And um, we, are we quoted, are we? We're not quoted yet. And we have Claire on the phone as well. Claire, sorry, Claire. <laughs> yes, we are quoted by members. You must do it yourself. We'll be seated in a well distance. There's Harry now as well. Um, Barbara will be clerking the meeting today. And the meeting will include a briefing from the research raise on the protocol. Uh, Susie and Mark, you're very welcome. A departmental briefing on the business plan. A closed session on the FWP um, and the expected dear legislative programme and a statutory instrument on climate change. Claire Morris will be joining us by the committee via a teleconference. Claire, is Morris joined yet? No? I haven't heard from Morris yet. It's okay. Um, maybe Morris will join us after a bit. And I will advise members of the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout part of buildings and online. And as usual, you can use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and they are muted. Um, we have an apology in from Patsy, Patsy Malone. I want to refer members to the draft minutes uh, held on the 11th of June, pages 5 to 10. And the note of the informal meeting on the 18th of June at pages 11 to 13. Uh, can I seek agreement for the meeting from the for the minutes? And can I seek agreement to publish the note of the informal meeting on the committee web page? Okay. Okay. Um, matters arising. Can I refer members to? Um, I'll just sign these here now. Just for... uh, Correspondence from the department on issues raised at the meeting on, on the 4th of June, pages 15 to 16, and the meeting on the 11th of June, pages 17 and 19. Members will note that the second letter at page 17 contains information on expenditure of idea on implementation of the protocol. Um, are members, any comments or are they happy enough to note this correspondence? Okay. Okay. Um, so we have an, now have an oral briefing uh, on the protocol. Um, that's on page 21 to 56 of your your packs. Um, I want to uh, welcome Mark and uh, Susie, the research officers. I want to commend you as well on a very, very comprehensive piece of work. I uh, just had a, an opportunity to go through it yesterday. So I want to uh, invite you now perhaps to uh, present uh, the research paper. Okay. And there will be questions following that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, members, um, for the opportunity to come and, and talk to you today uh, on, on the protocol. I have to say, those of you who have seen it, and even by the page numbers, this paper is long and quite complex, um, but that is, is really a reflection of the protocol itself uh, and the processes around it. You will no doubt be relieved, given the warmth of, of the, the room as well, is that we are not going to go through the entire paper, um, Susie and myself. Our focus really is, is really going to be on section six of the paper, and that's pages, um, I can't even uh, exactly remember in terms of just, well, it's the latter part. 50 or so of your 50 to 56 in your pack. Um, we will, however, make, uh, try to bring some of those issues to life with some references in the paper, the wider paper, and we'll share um, those with you when we actually raise them. We're also going to split the presentation, obviously, between us, so at various points we'll hand over. Um, and if you are happy to do so, if you could bear with us, we're happy to take questions at the end. Um, if we're in a position to answer them, I have to say, for a lot of the stuff in this, we probably aren't going to be able to answer those, but we, we can at least, we're happy to have the conversation or go away and see what we can find. Um, our rationale, I suppose, really, for, for the approach that we're taking today is twofold. Um, firstly, we're not going to go through all of the detail we have in the early parts of this paper because a lot of it you've either heard or read or heard from other stakeholders <coughs> who may, have either been before you or may be before you in the coming months. There's still information there and there's still questions, there's still issues that are relevant, but we didn't want to focus on them because we think other people will be doing that um, and you'll be hearing similar themes already. We also thought it might be useful to actually look at the protocol in relation to what yourselves as a committee, other committees, the Assembly in general and the Executive uh, can possibly do to minimise some of the potential challenges presented by the, uh, the protocol moving forward. I also have to say, um, just for, for clarification, this paper is not intended as a forensic uh, examination of the protocol in terms of its content or, more crucially, its implementation. Because, as you will all be aware at this time, um, there are elements of the protocol which are still effectively a work in progress um, and are subject to the, the ongoing UK EU negotiations. It's really a first taste, uh, and it's our effort of trying to do that. Albeit we may be failed in the sense of the complexity of it, but um, I think it's a difficult one to pitch. 
So the, the sections, section two gives you a bit of background to the Brexit process and the transition period so far. That's pages 22 to 23. Section three then effectively uh, describes and outline terms and nature of the protocol and some of its intended purpose, including the summary of the key articles. And when I say key articles, we've picked out those that we think might be of particular interest to the ERA committee. That's pages 24 to 32. Section 4 then looks at the annexes to the protocol, and particularly the importance of Annex 2, and that's pages 33 to 39 in your, your pack. Section 5 looks at the, the operation and the architecture of the protocol, including the function and makeup of the Joint Committee. That's pages 39 to 50. And then, as I say, we, we end with Section 6, uh, which is really a set of observations, uh, which is pages 50 to 56 and some questions. Before I start just on that, I just want to highlight six more things. Three givens around the withdrawal agreement that led to the protocol, and three givens around the protocol as follows. So the givens for the withdrawal agreement. The withdrawal agreement effectively commits the UK and the EU to negotiations on a future relationship. And the terms of those negotiations are set out in the political declaration. And that includes that a, a free trade agreement is the desired outcome of both parties. And the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol stands no matter what, though its application will be impacted by the outcome of the negotiations. And that, I have to say, was actually, and I know you were listening in last week, that was confirmed by Michael Gove at the Northern Ireland um, Affairs Committee at Westminster last week. Secondly, just on, on three more points just in terms of the givens around the protocol. The protocol and the provisions within it will come into force on the 1st of January 2021. That's unless a further extension is agreed, which I have to say appears to be outside the current legal context that we have, or if the EU managed to uh, agree with the UK, there would be an implementation period. Secondly, the protocol remains in place until such time as the Northern Ireland Assembly may vote to rescind it. And it also maybe a point that isn't as widely known. If the, the Assembly, in four years after the end of transition, decides to do that, that power would only extend to Articles 5 to 10. The rest of the protocol is there and will be. Thirdly, the UK-EU Joint Committee has a key and ongoing role in the development, management and review of many of the provisions within the protocol, and Susie will touch upon some of that later. So just firstly then uh, to Section 6. Uh, I'm just going to take 6.1 and then I'll hand over to Susie. And I suppose the central point we were trying to make <coughs> in section 6.1 was that the impacts of the protocol here are directly related to the nature of the future UK-EU trading uh, arrangements. The protocol recognises that. It's written um, even Article 13 itself within the protocol. And much of the commentary around it is the determining factor on the scale and extent of the measures within it that will be deployed really relates to the nature of the UK-EU trading relationship. I have to say at this time it is clear that there are, remain significant areas of disagreement on that front. Um, and as the UK and EU strive to secure a free trade agreement, there are indications that that negotiating process may run very close to the deadline of the end of the year. And I have to say that, that makes the sort of work that we are doing quite challenging. And I think it makes the work that the departments are doing even more challenging. <coughs> that narrative um, really has been further focused by the fact that you, you will be aware that the, the UK has now confirmed to the EU at the most recent joint committee meeting that they will not be seeking an extension to the transition period. So that effectively means the protocol comes into force on the 1st of January 2021, unless there is an extension or an implementation period. Interestingly, one of my colleagues flagged this morning, uh, a journalist um, in London had submitted an FOI request, I think, to the Cabinet Office and has managed to establish that the Cabinet Office had sought legal advice as to whether the actual uh, requirement for a transition extension to be notified by the 30th of June was binding. Now, that could be prudent or it may be an indication that maybe this game isn't over. Maybe there could be a further developments in that later in the year. We don't know the legal advice that has been published, but it has. But there was undoubtedly legal advice commissioned on that issue. I thought that was just an interesting aside. 
or as I said, there could be, um, although Michael Gove ruled this out last week, the concept of an implementation period, that not all of the measures would come into force on day one, that you could have a staggered or a phased approach, reflecting the capability of the departments and uh, arms length bodies and others here to deliver on the commitments in the protocol. But again, Michael Gove last week seemed to be clear that that would not be the case. Again, who knows, really, is what I'm, I'm saying here. The actual nature of what will come in uh, to force here is very much still in play. There are, I suppose, broadly three scenarios. Um, optimistically, uh, if the EU and the UK negotiations deliver a free trade agreement, which is <coughs> comprehensive and based on an ongoing commitment to maintain broadly similar or recognised standards across a range of areas, there may be grounds for elements of the protocol to either be dropped or significantly watered down. That's, that's if, that, if you achieve that. Um, because many of the, the actual protocol elements are designed to protect the EU single market, whilst enabling free movement of goods in the island of Ireland. Some of those may lose their rationale if you had a comprehensive trade agreement. That's, and I, I'm being speculative in that nature, but it, it's, and I think it's, it's ways to raise it. Less optimistically, if the UK and EU fail to agree a comprehensive trade agreement or a less comprehensive trade agreement, that might not facilitate the removing or the easing of some of the measures within the protocol, but there could uh, simply the act of agreeing itself might create an environment where there might be a greater opportunity for a more maybe relaxed application of the protocol. That's speculative as well, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a fair point to make. That could be a potential win, um, but again, this is very much determined by the outcome of the ongoing talks. Thirdly, and I have to say pessimistically, um, in circumstances where, where no UK-EU trade deal can be agreed by the end of the year, I think that's a scenario that we probably fear the most in the sense that the opportunity to either remove or dilute the impacts of the challenge elements when the protocol, you have to say, would be potentially severely restricted or even potentially impossible as a result of that, unless the Assembly rejected them in four years' time. Um, a breakdown in UK-EU relations as well might also make the Joint Committee, and Susie will maybe bring a bit to light in terms of how critical the Joint Committee is to the operation of the protocol. If there's bad blood between the two sides, that might make the Joint Committee operation challenging. Um, I have included a couple of examples from the paper to, to, to highlight some of the challenges you're facing in this, and those are <coughs> within Table 1, which is pages 26 to 31. I'm just going to mention to you very quickly. Article 5 uh, on page 26. Um, this is one of the critical issues around the determination of whether goods enter in Northern Ireland from GB are at risk of entering the EU single market. And it's a major issue, really, I suppose, in terms of tariffs and duties. And the EU and UK are at very different points on this matter. The EU's default position seems to be that all goods are at risk unless proven otherwise, whereas the UK position is, well, that should only happen if, if risk is proven to be genuine and substantial. So there's quite a gulf between those two positions. Um, the outcome of a trade agreement could have a significant bearing on what we actually end up with there. If you had a, a free trade agreement with tariff-free trade, agreed common product standards, that might mitigate that issue. That might reduce the potential risk um, in the mind of the Joint Committee who will be looking at this. If you had less extensive agreement, you might still possibly mitigate through goodwill. If we had no trade agreement, will that rule then fall solely to the Joint Committee and to trying to reach agreement as to what is at risk? And that may prove in our assessment to be a challenging process because you could have two diametrically opposed views. And Susie can maybe say a bit later if there isn't agreement as to where that potentially leads us. The other one I just want to focus on is um, Article 7 on page 28 in the table. And this really relates to the mutual recognition of non-harmonised standards. Just a bit of background on this. <coughs> mutual recognition, you may, have, you may well be aware, is the principle of EU law under which goods that are legally sold in one EEA or EU country within the EEA, EEA can be sold in any other. So effectively, if it's qualified to be sold in one, it can go up to the others. And mutual recognition which is what that is, applies to so-called non-harmonised standards in goods, and that can include foodstuffs. 
So goods that aren't what are those non-harmonised standards? Those are goods not already covered by EU-wide legislation set in common requirements. So there are these things around the edges for which there isn't a very defined set of EU rules. The difficulty we have in this is, and again, I don't know how widely known these are because we find them quite hard to find. The EU has produced a series of technical notes as to the position to stakeholders post-transition. And one of them, which I have quoted from there in relation to food law post-Brexit, makes clear that the Commission's position is as follows. In the non-harmonised area, this is relating to food, the fact that a food is legally placed on the market of Northern Ireland cannot be invoked when the food is placed on the market in the EU. So the predica uh, predication of the protocol that it enabled the free movement of goods on an all-Ireland basis, or effectively Northern Ireland goods getting access to the single market, that appears to be somewhat contradicted by that, that term, that phrase, in the technical note. Is that the EU's final position? Is that a negotiating position? I'm not clear. Um, and what does that mean for local producers of non-harmonised foods? Does that effectively put additional conditions on access to the single market? What, for example, would be the impacts on north-south trade from that? Would that just mean a delay in the process, or would it present other challenges? Because how would you effectively uh, ensure uh, that your food was recognised within another market or get access to it? Now, if you get into one, as I said, well, then you will probably get access to the rest. I just put it there as a, an example. So an FTA, or free trade agreement with extensive common product standards and mutual recognition across the board, might mitigate that. Less extensive agreement would be less. And again, in the instance where we had no trade agreement, um, is that where effectively we left with the Commission's technical note? Is that the position? So I just I postulate that as a question. Just some very quick consideration points before I hand over to Susie. Um, is the lack of clarity in the potential outcome of the UK-EU trade arrangements is that creating particular operational challenges for DERA in relation to the potential implementation of the protocol? Is DERA planning at this point focused on a potential worst case scenario? So hope for the best but plan for the worst in the form of the, the full and rigid implementation of the protocol in January? Has the formal rejection of an extension to the transition period at this point changed DERA's priorities in relation to the implementation of the protocol? And has DERA had either any input to or sight of the legislation which the UK government is bringing forward, apparently before the end of 2020, to enable unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods to the GB market. And at that point, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Susie. Thank you. Yes, I'm just going to carry on uh, with point uh, 6.2 in your papers. Um, it's on, I think, page 52 of your packs. And this really is looking at the scope and the nature of the protocol. Um, I suppose really focusing on the competing narratives and uh, the difference in the starting points in terms of the language um, that's used in the protocol between the UK and uh, the EU. Uh, throughout this uh, section, members might want to refer back to Table 4 in the packs. It gives a little bit more detail. Um, it's on page 49 um, of your packs. So, as highlighted in Table 4, and as Mark has also mentioned already, um, uh, in relation to at-risk products, uh, the UK and the EU are already at different starting points in relation to how the protocol will work. Now, this could be partly explained by the ambiguous and vague language within the protocol and the withdrawal agreement. Now, the, the ambiguity and the lack of detail of the protocol was recently highlighted by the Irish Government uh, Minister for European Affairs. Ellen McEntee, and uh, her issue is uh, noted just on page 52 of your packs. I'll not go through it right now. Um, so the challenge really now is that this ambiguous and vague language, uh, which is delivered in the protocol, um, could potentially threaten the ability to deliver it. Now, just as an example, and shown in table four of your packs, the UK's position on the role of the Joint Committee is outlined by Michael Gove as an opportunity to develop the protocol. However, this does not reflect the EU's opinion that the protocol cannot be renegotiated, including at, in the Joint Committee. In addition, the EU has argued that an EU office in Northern Ireland is necessary for officials to exercise their rights to be present where EU law is being applied, 
and this is under Article 12 of the Protocol. Now, the UK, however, is of the opinion that it's not necessary for a protocol to work and that this would risk being perceived as a return to joint controls. So far, two meetings of the Joint Committee have taken place, on the 30th of March and again the 12th of June. Now, the details of the meetings have been provided through press statements by both the UK Cabinet Office and the European Commission. However, the detail provided, as yet, does not appear to suggest that these issues have been resolved in any way. Um, and then just a few consideration points on this. Um, what will happen if agreement is not met on the operation of the Joint Committee as an opportunity to develop? Um, what will happen if agreement on a permanent EU presence in Northern Ireland is not met? Could this be something that would be brought through arbitration? And arbitration I'm going to look at uh, later in the paper. So I'll just move on to 6.3. Really, this is focusing on the role of the Joint Committee and in securing local access and influence so as to minimise any potential challenges. And this starts on page 53 of your pack. Again, members may wish to refer to table 3 throughout this section, which does provide a bit more detail. And it starts on page 40 of your packs. It's a large table. So, as I've said, table 3 explores a number of mechanisms mentioned within the withdrawal agreement for the operation of the protocol. These include the Joint Committee, Specialised Committee, the Consultative Working Group, Arbitration Panel, CJEU and the Business Engagement Forum. Table 3 gives an overview of their roles and responsibilities and the level of representation and highlights some further consideration points. I was out going through them all right now. The main point really derived from this is that the Despite the range of bodies created by the withdrawal agreement, most of, most of which merely provide more of a discussion forum for recommendations, final decisions will be made by the Joint Committee only. So this could include issues such as the adoption of new EU legislation, the definition of whether goods are at risk of entering the EU single market, as Mark had mentioned earlier, and the setting of the ceiling of, on agricultural support that will be allowed here will have significant impacts. And in that context, there is a real need to ensure that a Northern Ireland voice is both heard, present and listened to at the Joint Committee level. Now, it has been encouraging that um, the Executive Ministers have so far participated in the first and the second um, meetings of the Joint Committee, but the fact still remains that the presence was by invitation rather than by right. Paragraph 9 of the New Decade New Approach, shown on page 53 of your PACs, and restated again by the UK uh, Government's command paper, made a commitment in relation to the Executive's involvement in the work of the Joint Committee. So on first reading, this may appear to be a positive development. However, there could in effect be a potential double lock on Executive participation, as this can only occur when the following two conditions are met that Northern Ireland's specific matters are being discussed and that the Irish Government are attending as part of the EU delegation. So really, clarification on the definitions and application here would be useful and might also help to formalise a process that might otherwise appear to be based on trust and subjective assessment. Again, we've just pulled together a few consideration points at this stage. Really, does DERA or the Executive have any insight or input into how Northern Ireland's specific matters are being defined by the UK Government? Is the EU similarly minded in terms of definition? Has the Executive been lobbying for the development of objective and transparent criteria to ensure appropriate Irish Government and Executive representation on both um, the UK and EU delegations at the Joint Committee meetings? Is this an issue that could be taken forward in the specialised or the joint committees? And also, is it DARE's understanding or expectation that all new proposed EU legislation that may be adopted in the protocol, and that would be subject to joint committee approval, would qualify as being Northern Ireland's specific matter? And do DARE officials expect to be involved in all discussions on all proposed EU legislation that may be adopted in the protocol at the uh, specialised committee level. So, 
That was just a summary of some of the points that are also in page um, or in table three that go through each of the different mechanisms and raise some points that are more um, specific to those different bodies. Now, just by way um, of an example, um, page 34 of your PACS uh, mentions the update that was provided to the Annex, uh, to Annex 2 on the 15th of May. And this brought about the inclusion of a number of different directives, one of which being the new plastics directive. And really just brings a number of questions um, to the surface in terms of where was the decision on these new additions made and who was involved in the decision. And as I've said, you can refer to table three and page 39 as well for a bit more detail on these consideration points. So at this point, I'm just going to hand back over to Mark. And he's going to continue. Thank you, Susie and members. I'm just going to refer now to point 6.4 on page 54 in your pack, and that's this idea around the need for enhanced intelligence uh, on EU and legislative developments, and maybe exploring what role uh, the executive can play here. Um, I think it's fair to say that DERA is in the firing line here, along with other departments, in the sense that the protocol presents significant new challenges uh, with regards to the amendment or replacement of existing EU legislation, never mind the addition of new EU legislation predominantly to Annex II. Um, whilst new legislation proposed for the inclusion of the protocol is subject to joint committee approval, and I think that's a good thing, um, there is no such process for either an amendment, an update or a replacement to existing EU legislation in the Annex and the protocol. That's going to be auto, uh, automatically updated. You may have heard this term referred to you. If you haven't, you will hear from here on of dynamic alignment. So that happens automatically. Um, I think that does raise significant con and particular concerns uh, if the process results in changes that could have operational impacts on the ground here. Um, a particular concern here, and this is one actually we flagged earlier in the year in relation even to the bills that were coming forward. Um, would be the potential that any changes could have in existing derogations or variations that we have from uh, or have benefit from under existing EU legislation. Now, as I said here today, I don't know how many derogations we benefit from across the pieces of legislation in the protocol and the annexes. I think that's a quite a, a significant and a critical question to know, because if we do benefit from any, the mechanism by which we can continue to do so I think is one that we would have concerns about. I'll touch upon that later. Um, because we have to face the fact that we, we don't have any representation at either elected or official level going forward. So how, how could we actually extend existing derogations? Or how could we even secure new derogations? What's the process? Is the Joint Committee maybe the way, the way that we could maybe do it through for new derogations? But for ones which are maybe going to expire, what are we going to do? I think combined with a lack of clarity in terms of executive representation and influence on the Joint Committee um, regards to EU new EU legislation, there may be grounds for considering I think, additional mechanisms to try and influence the design of both updated and new legislation at an upstream point. So by the time it gets to the Joint Committee, it may potentially be too late to make significant change. And that, I think, uh, maybe raises the question around, well, what can you do? We Looking at it, I think there might be two potential steps that could be looked at. The first one is the idea of this collective intelligence in terms of really identifying what changes might be coming over the horizon and seeking to identify who is likely to be responsible when and how. And that's really what I'm talking really within Brussels. Secondly, uh, there's this idea about trying to influence the policy direction. So you really want to be thinking about okay, what impact is this proposed change going to have? And how do we either minimise the negative impact or maximise potential benefits that could be coming from new EU legislation by engaging with, with lobbying, either the bodies or the individuals making the decisions? As figure one on page 37 of your paper there in the pack, uh, it shows where the actual uh, ordinary EU legislation uh, process is. And it highlights that there could well be potential for lobbying activity within the policy formulation stage. I say that knowing, in fact, that it does happen. Any of you who have been to Brussels will be aware of the number of lobbyists. In fact, the stat that I was able to find, and I have to say that the, the, this was stat-checked and fact-checked, 
and was actually the, the body that fact checked it thought it could have been an underestimate, but the figure was about 25 to 30,000 professional lobbyists in Brussels. Now, in the context of having an executive office in Brussels with 13 staff, you can see there may be challenges. However, um, that I think raises questions, uh, which I'll come to now. Um, is the executive giving active consideration to how the Brussels office can provide a means for identifying an influence in the, the EU legislative process in relation to both the existing and potential new provisions within the protocol? Secondly, is the executive committed to maintaining the Brussels office or potentially expanding its role and staffing levels and responsibilities? Is the executive developing a strategy around how best to influence the thinking of EU officials engaged and development policy that is either in or may be added to the protocol? And finally, is the executive developing a strategy around how best to influence the thinking of MEPs and member states engaged in developing and scrutinising policy that is either in or may be added to the protocol? And at that point, I'll, I'll just hand over to Susie. Um, yeah, I'm just going to carry on with the last section in uh, section 6, 6.5. So uh, while Mark was describing some of the potential opportunities um, to, I suppose, try and uh, prevent um, issues arising um, in terms of legislation or and getting involved at an early stage, this section really is looking at where we can't um, really uh, get any agreement and the process then that uh, that involves. So this is in relation to the arbitration panel and with respect to uh, representation on it. And again, table three uh, on page 44 of your packs gives more detail on this and the uh, selection process uh, for representation on the panel. I'll not go into the details of that now, but I'm happy to uh, at a later, later stage. So the Joint Committee uh, is responsible for handling disputes on the interpretation of anything within the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. However, if there is no solution found, issues are to be resolved through an arbitration panel. Now, as mentioned already, a number of areas of conflict in relation to the operation of the protocol have already surfaced between the EU and the UK. These areas will greatly affect the implementation of the protocol here in Northern Ireland. Therefore, it's important to consider the representation of Northern Ireland on the arbitration panel, especially if anything is to be resolved at this level. However, the level of detail provided within both the withdrawal agreement and the protocol itself does not suggest whether Northern Ireland will have any representation. Again, some of the points um, that we've highlighted here are really in relation to whether DARA has had any discussion with the UK government in relation to Northern Ireland representation, and how likely is it that there will be representation on either uh, the general panel or the chair's panel. And there's a bit more detail on the differences between those in the table. Also, who bears the cost of arbitration? Uh, both in terms of the, the process and the final outcomes? Does it either come from the Northern Ireland block grant or would the UK government cover all of the costs? Uh, just bringing this back to, um, to an example of where this, uh, the arbitration process might have an impact, and Mark had already uh, raised it in relation to the issue of mutual recognition of uh, non-harmonised standards. Um, where maybe certain authorisation may be required by member states. So in table three on page 44 of your PACs, uh, it highlights the point that in relation to the process of arbitration, according to Article 7 of the Protocol, where registrations, certificates or authorisations have been issued by authorities or bodies of member states, the UK in respect of Northern Ireland, may not initiate arbitration procedures for union law under the protocol. So again, it's just highlighting there just one of the areas of, of constraint that um, the UK may face in relation to representing Northern Ireland uh, within the arbitration process. So I'm just going to leave it there for now, um, but again, happy to take questions, discuss any other areas, and uh, <coughs> thank you very much. 
Okay, this is Mark. Um, that was um, very, very um, comprehensive, uh, very detailed and helpful piece of work uh, that you have uh, carried out here and presented to us in the paper and in your oral presentation here today. Really, really very, very detailed and very, very helpful. Um, and I suppose I'll be, I'll be studying it as we move on from here as well. So this is a piece of work that's ongoing. Um, I suppose, um, Mark, one of the things that when, when I was looking just through the, the, the paper, um, I, I, did, I did notice the reference to the, the British government had um, given commitment to unfettered access to the, the, the market over there for a year. You know, and we know the importance of the British market here in terms of, for example, our beef, for example. Absolutely. But I am aware that uh, certainly there is a lot of speculation around the exit declarations Absolutely. that could um, you know, cost in the region of between £15 and £56. Pounds. Mm -hmm. Do you have any assessment of that there, Mark, or any indication of... Um, obviously, it would have a huge impact on agri-food production here. I think, Chair, again, and um, it was actually one of the ones I could have picked upon to, to highlight even the, where we're at in terms of negotiation, because, um, for again, if any of you had the opportunity to watch the Northern Ireland Select of, uh, our Affairs Committee last week in Westminster, Michael Gove's response to a number of questions from members of that uh, committee was, well, we won't, be, we won't be asking for them, you'll have to ask somebody else. Um, so it, it, it told me, on the basis of that, that that is a, an area where they're very clearly isn't agreement on, and where the EU may be taking a diametrically opposed position. Mm. Um, in terms of a potential outcome, um, I think you're right to say the impacts there could be significant. Yeah. Um, but as to, it's above my pay grade to say whether that will be resolved and how. But I, I think um, you're right in to say that it is, a, it is one that we will definitely need clarity on, uh, because the impacts on some of the small and medium businesses that we have here the cost of those declarations could be significant. Um, the other thing to say on that is that, in relation, you mentioned the unfettered access, and we did put it in as a question. The um, government's uh, command paper outlined the UK government's approach to the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, or the Northern Ireland Protocol as it's referred to in, in that document, um, references the fact that there will be legislation coming forward before the end of the year. Now, we could find no reference uh, within the public domain or the public space as to the content or the how of how that would be achieved. The commitment is in that command paper, and indeed that was, it was referenced again last week. But uh, that's the reason we put it in as a question. I think it's a priority to get sight of it, to see how is it actually going to achieve that, and how does it deal with the issue of the exit summary declaration. Um, Mark, the other thing I want to just mention as well is the see the. Um the guidelines around the rules of origin, you know, in terms of access in the British market as well. You know, obviously their products will originate from here in the north, but there are many products, and obviously engineering would be an example, but there are also examples where perhaps cattle or livestock are finished yep. here and maybe originated from the south of Ireland. Absolutely. How, how, how will all of that integrate with uh, the, the, the guarantee of unfair access to the British markets? Again, Chair, um, I would love to be able to answer that question, but I am not in a position to do so. But as you, as you say, um, I think the complexity uh, of supply chains around certain product areas and food, I mean, you know, it, it, there are areas of milk goes south yeah. of the border to be dried, to come back north. Yeah. What products is it used in? Is it going to a cake? Does it go into something else that goes across the water? There's big, big questions around the reserve. I have to say, maybe in that regard, I know my colleagues uh, from uh, another team in research had looked at a number of those issues. Um, that's something we might be able to, to share with you as yeah. a paper. But uh, in terms of answers, I think all we're really able to identify at this mm. point is questions. Yeah. Uh, but recognising that there are particular challenges there that will have to be dealt with. Yeah. And as to whether that legislation deals with them, well, it's, it's as good a guess as... I don't know. I don't know if it'll be in it, and I don't know how they will manage to do that and get the agreement of the EU to it. And even also, I suppose, on our point as well, and um, whilst the protocol will enable uh, cross-border all-island sort of trade, which is important given the, the, the island-wide nature of the um, dairy and the agriculture, agri-food processing sector, if we're going to have two different immigration regimes. North and south as well, that will certainly have an impact on the availability of, for example, seasonal labour from other countries here in the north. And 
obviously, obviously there'd be a concern as well in terms of if you have a different immigration regime here in the north than you have in the south, then would you have the spectre of the of the border agency, you know, guarding or, or checking the border checks, for example, to make sure that there isn't maybe people from uh, who aren't eligible down to the north but can into the south because it remains part of the EU? Mm -hmm. is, is that I, th I have to say it wasn't something we touched upon in this paper, but yeah. as, as you'll be aware, we touched upon it in, in previous papers. Yeah. On the, and I think um, there is a recognition that, that Labour does present challenges, again, yeah. very much dependent upon what the final outcome is. Yeah. Um, I think um, the one I would say in the North-South movement, I did mention this, was the mutual recognition issue, and yeah. I mentioned foodstuffs. I would say, recommend, if you get the opportunity, to go and look at the, the technical notes, because there are a range of ones that deal, for example, with issues like... Um, Yes, there's one I just one I picked up. I didn't have time to put in the paper. There's not many to read. This is a, a technical note that the European Commission published in terms of the transport of live animals. Um, the significant thing in this is a transporter, and I'm reading here from us, a transporter authorization certificate of approval, a certificate of competence issued by the United Kingdom in respect of Northern Ireland, is only valid in Northern Ireland. Mm. So if I'm moving live animals south, which a lot of our lamb, for example, goes mm -hmm. that direction, nearly 50%. who now has to provide me with an authorisation? So. I don't have an answer. I put it up as a question. But I would suggest that a lot of people maybe haven't even read these. Um, it's it's um, a, a common uh, problem across a lot of the different areas. Uh, they've also a few notes on reach, you know, um, chemical substances, and it's a similar idea in terms of it's this idea of authorizations between whether it's here or EU or somebody who to you can um, be authorized by somebody within the EU. And again, then that leads through to the whole arbitration side of things as well in relation to then if you're authorised through an EU member state, does that rule you out of being able to uh, request then the arbitration? So. Okay. Um, thank you. I'll move around. William, you have the Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank Mark and Susie for their presentation. It's very good indeed. Um, I suppose in essence, Till there's a train deal, or to the, till we know what's happening, we are everyone's up in the air practically. I did ask the question in relation to to department officials. Um, I can ask it to yourselves, but I think you'll have the same answer. It was this, this 70 percent of all meat produced in the Irish Republic goes into the mainland UK? Some of it actually comes to Northern Ireland to be processed. Mm -hmm. I asked the question if that moves on then. Has that unfettered access? I could not get an answer on that. Because there is, I know two processors very close to me, imports um, dead cattle, processes it, and moves it on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are a lot of questions uh, that, as you say, probably that at this moment in time, there's no clear answer to. Yeah, I, think, I think we are waiting for progress on negotiations, and we're waiting for publication of that legislation. Now, uh, that legislation it's probably unlikely to arrive now, given that we're on, on the cusp of summer. But I think come the autumn, um, if, there is, if there is to be legislation to guarantee unfettered access, I think it will be one will be interesting to read and see how it deals with issues like exit summary, rules of origin, and other uh, significant issues that could present major challenges to the agri-food sector and others. Yeah, but government, the UK government has given undertaking that there will be unfettered access, isn't that right? It, 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 yes, the, the the commitment is there to legislate for unfettered access. Um, how that's done. The, the, I think that's the fundamental question: is that how do you achieve mm -hmm. that? And is that maybe to play devil's advocate? Is that achievable? And is that achievable uh, with the agreement of the EU? Because not all of this is the unilateral gift of the UK government. I also see an issue whereby how you define what is likely to move on to the Irish Republic and what is to stay in Northern Ireland. No, absolutely. And I, I have to say that was the point I was making in relation to non-harmonised standards and areas. There present challenges there. Um, we, we know Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole has always been noted for. I think the only other point I would make on that to you is this may be challenging at the minute, but to go back to a theme that we touched upon, Susie and myself, in, in 2016, we are starting at a point where we are at the same point legislatively. If you have legislative uh, divergence and regulatory divergence, it becomes a lot harder. 
And I think a lot of that, again, will depend on the type of deal that is negotiated. If it's a, if it's a comprehensive trade deal that commits people to an ongoing set of common standards, well, some of these issues may well be smoothed out. If it doesn't deliver that, and you have two parties that move in separate directions... If there's a no deal, you mean? Yes. Yeah. That can present... I think some of the challenges we're talking about here would be accentuated in those circumstances. Can we just bring John in here? In case we could come back around, right? Me, Chair, thank you, and thank you, Mark and Susie, for the uh, presentation and the very detailed report. Um, no, nobody here would be surprised to know that I have concerns about much of what's in there. It's not the fault, of course, of the authors of the report. I, um, not least of all, I should say, the, the issues around representation, whether that's at arbitration at a later stage or in preparation now. And in relation to, to preparation, can I ask through the Chair? Um, is much or any of this dependent on the proper frameworks and infrastructure being put in place prior to the 1st of January next year? For example, in infrastructure at the ports or the import of animals or any other product for that matter. Um, I'm expecting that some of that infrastructure will, will require statutory permissions, but that some of the issues around designation for, for these ports could take months, in fact. Um, is any of what's been planned dependent on a start date at a certain point? And if so, what do the problems become then if that infrastructure isn't there prior to and in time for that start date? I think that's a difficult um, question to answer, John, because we, we don't know we don't, um, yeah. on the basis of the documentation we have. That's what Susie and myself actually had the conversation around, and I mentioned earlier about the idea of an implementation period. Um, the play, uh, there may have been people in Northern Ireland, for example, who may have welcomed a, an extension to transition to prepare. At this point, we don't have that, so the clock is ticking. The question then becomes if um, ports and other component parts that are critical to the delivery of the protocol aren't ready in January, what is the response? Um, does the Joint Committee consider that? Does that go to arbitration? Or does that end up with the, the Court of Justice, European Court of Justice, to make a ruling? Would we, for example, in that instance, would we be facing infraction proceedings? I don't know. Uh, those are points of law. Um, I raise those questions because those are the sort of things that could happen. But in terms of what will happen, I don't know. Um, I think it would be interesting to hear from Dara's perspective as to how likely they think they will be to be operationally ready come January. And that also touches upon, and it is, it's, it's shifting sands here, what is it they will be required to implement? Because if you have a comprehensive trade agreement that might mitigate some of these requirements, you may be ready. Yeah. If you have no deal, it could be more challenging. But I'm not in a position, as was where we're sitting in research, no, to have all the information no, 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 no. to know. But, <clears throat> but I think that part of the process... Susie, do you want to say maybe something even on the, on the arbitration process? And, yeah, I mean, one of the other parts that I didn't really get to touch upon in the uh, presentation today, but it's in the paper, is in relation to the role of the CJEU. And uh, so really, we're, one of the questions that we'd put to it is this, the different levels of enforcement now that Northern Ireland might um, be subject to. So the CJEU can be brought in under anything that's in relation to EU law in terms of a dispute. So if there is an issue that's been brought uh, to the arbitration panel and they feel that this is in relation to implementation of EU law, they can request that the CJEU takes that on board. So again, we are having another level where the CJEU has jurisdiction over, over some of those areas. Again, at, at the arbitration um, panel, it has to be upon their agreement that they see it as a, an EU law or an issue of, of EU law. So that representation at the arbitration panel level is also important. So while we also want to make sure we're in the discussions at the prevention stage, then worst case scenario, we still want to be in the discussions at whenever it comes to um, any enforcement stage. And that's where there's big, big questions. Um, and again, then, if there is the, the issue of implementation, um, once the, the date comes and we don't have the resources or the infrastructure in place, where does that leave us? 
in terms of arbitration on CDAE. Thank you both. Okay, Rosemary. Yeah, um, going back to regulatory divergence, in relation to goods, Northern Ireland produced goods alone. Will that mean that they could be less well recognised in the Great Britain? I think there, there's always a potential because for, for some reason a lot of the, the emphasis on regulatory divergence has been EU great, UK bad, so it's a race to the bottom. There's no guarantee that will be the case. Regulatory divergence can go in different directions. Um, I think it's all about access to markets for us. And given the GB is a number of, of members have, have raised already, including the chair, that it's a critical market. Mm -hmm. I think there is a risk if we find ourselves bound to a series of EU regulations, which the UK decides, well, we're going higher. Mm -hmm. If the bar moved higher in those instances, well, yes. And that brings again the issue of unfettered access. Is it unfettered access whilst our standards are the same, or is it unfettered access in perpetuity? Those are questions that I, I think would be interesting to have a conversation around because I think divergence there could potentially be a significant threat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Mark, do you see the? Sorry, Rosemary. Do yeah, you, no, you're okay. Um, do you see? You see the Claire and Morris. Um, Claire and Morris, are, are you are you still tuned in there? Do you want to come in on anything? <laughs> Are you okay, Claire? Do you want to raise anything, or um... I just, I just want to say thanks very much for the report. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's hard to get answers, as you rightly point out, because it just raises so many questions. And I hope that we're in the political process at the minute. But I'm just really trying to reflect on how this is playing out at a practical level for um, for the sector, for businesses, for farmers, um, and. and <laughs> Idea. Sorry, am I getting up too fast? Is that me? That was me. So it was. I was trying to put the microphone to the speaker there and it didn't fu function properly. Claire, can you repeat your last couple of sentences, please? No, I was going to maybe just ask, in terms of the Joint Committee and looking at um, the problems or the issues maybe in, in trying to define what are at-risk groups, um, if this issue is, is passed up to an arbitration panel, do you, from what you've looked at so far, is that likely to be a long, drawn-out process? And so, if we, if 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 these regulations come into effect on the first of January, for example, and we're still um, bargaining over what is at risk, or if there are new goods or other goods coming in, where the dynamic alignment doesn't happen, and um, if something's raised at the arbitration level, is I'm just thinking. How long drawn out of a process would that be, do you think? Um, I'll just come in on that, uh, Claire. So, um, if I can just refer you to that table three um, in the paper, and it gives a, a little bit more detail about the operation of arbitration. Um, if I can just find it myself. So, um, in terms of the the sort of the time frame, if an issue was if an, if, if an issue was to arise and it was to be um, brought up to the arbitration panel, the withdrawal agreement does actually suggest a time frame that the arbitration panel must make a decision by. Now, I can't. Um, come to that off the top of my head, um, but it's under 171, Article 171 of the Withdrawal Agreement, um, and it lists the time frame. So there is a set time frame. Um, I would need to have a look at that to see exactly what it is, but it does bind the arbitration panel to make a decision within, within that time frame. So that would ultimately um, narrow it down to so that it couldn't roll on too long. But like any of these things, if um, they were to link it back to EU legislation and then want to bring it up with the CJEU, then it would go through the normal CJEU process and timeframes. 
I don't know if that helps any. Hey, sir. Yes, it's just. Did I ask one more? Go for it, yeah. I'm just thinking specifically in terms of um, standards. So where is it at? The committee is looking at the bills coming through from Westminster in terms of the environment bill and the fisheries bill. So we're looking at the environment bill specifically at the minute. And in terms of being able to sort of set these standards, Northern Ireland does not have a specific kind of legislation for um, our environment. For an, we don't have an environment act. I'm just wondering, have you any thoughts in terms of how these three separate bills will sort of, how does that fit into the call? Is there something you can be doing now as these bills are moving through the legislative process to try and maybe use those to get some sort of clarification or um, protection or setting of standards? Would it be really mean of me to ask you to repeat that last sentence, Claire? I, I'm, I'm getting the idea that you're looking in terms standards. of environmental standards through legislation. Yes, yeah, we're currently looking at those going through the process at the minute, um, but nothing's been signed up, so the work's in progress. So is there an opportunity that we could potentially use the bill for to maybe try and clarify or set standards that might be helpful? Right. Um, well, yeah. Uh, with respect to the environment bill, uh, as you um, as you know, Claire, there were a not, there were a number of areas that uh, weren't being put upon Northern Ireland to um, actually implement unless it was to be decided at a later stage by the minister to bring in through a separate piece of legislation. Um, so that would be your targets, environmental targets, and um, a number of standards. So again, that would be it would depend on the appetite of the minister as to whether they would want as to whether he would want to go ahead outside the environment bill to bring those forward, but some of them aren't being required under the environment bill as such. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um yeah, uh, Chair, uh, I had a number of questions, but they've been answered either by yourselves uh, initially or, or been asked by other members. Just in terms of the protocol and implementation bodies, there's a business, business engagement forum. Uh, so, I mean, how is this membership made up? Or who? Yes, um, I, I thought I would put that into the table. Um, it hasn't actually, it's not something that's been formalised under the protocol or okay. the withdrawal agreement itself. That seems to be um, something that was mentioned in the uh, command paper, the, the UK uh, government's command paper, and uh, with the, they made this commitment of, of setting up the, the business um, engagement forum. So it is seen as an opportunity to invite um, Northern Ireland businesses uh, to just a you know, discussion table. But like um, most of the mechanisms, even under the protocol, it's more of a, a discussion agree. forum. Um, they can make recommendations to the specialised uh, committee, who then make their recommendations on those basis to the joint committee, who would take the final decision. But again, that, that's outside any of the requirements of the protocol or the withdrawal agreement. That was just something that has been set up uh, between the UK government and, and here. Fair enough. Are you looking now? That's dead on okay. Now. Okay, then, folks. Um, what the members have put down for um, asking my questions. So, again, uh, Mark and Susie, I want to just uh, again thank you very much for your very detailed presentation and your very comprehensive answers to all the questions that were raised. And no doubt we'll be hearing from you as this um, this transition or as we move towards the. Uh, the, the, the D Day, the end of. I think this is a, an issue, Chair, will keep us occupied for some time, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. Well, thank you, Sam. Um, <laughs> thank very, you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Okay, All the best. best. Thank you. Okay. Members, we are um, <coughs> now going to receive an oil briefing from the uh, Department um, from the, uh, on, the, on the DERA Business Plan 2021. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to take a slight pause here for uh, cleaning.
I want to refer you to um, the, the correspondence in the Department at page 58 to 60 of your packs and the draft business plan at pages 61 to 75. I'd like to take this opportunity now to welcome uh, Dr. Dennis McMahon, the Permanent Secretary, Norman Fulton, the Deputy Secretary of Food and Farming Group, and David Small, uh, Deputy Secretary of Environment, Marine and Fisheries Group, and Roger, Roger Downey, Grade 5 Finance Director. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity now, um, uh, Dennis, to um, brief the committee. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our Dear Business Plan to you. Um, just say a few words, if that's okay, just to introduce it. The plan is quite different from previous plans, and that there are a number of reasons for that. First, I suppose we're coming through a once in a generation pandemic. Rapid and discontinuous change has happened and is happening, and I suppose while change is inevitable, progress is not, so we need to secure that. The second point, I suppose, is about the fact that we're approaching the end of the transition period following the UK's exit from the EU. So we haven't seen actual changes resulting from that as yet, or many actual changes, but there, there's been some. But I suppose, as, as with our previous session, uh, changes will happen over the coming months. And third, it's clear that even prior to the pandemic, there was a huge growth in public awareness on the environment. So this has increased very significantly for a range of reasons, but not clear, at the, not least the clear responsive nature to what's being termed, uh, see by BBC, the anthropause. So it's a new word for me anyway, but it's a, a, a very good way of describing what's happened. Our business plan reflects these major environmental, economic and societal changes, and importantly, it reflects the Minister's wish to have sustainability at the centre of our plans, our actions and our outcomes as framed in our purpose, which is sustainability at the heart of a living, working, active landscape valued by everyone. Um, in respect to the 2020 to 2021 year, work has been undertaken to develop business plan targets for the Department, which recognise, one, the need to address the challenges of today, as well as, two, looking to the future to renew the Department. Uh, the economy and the environment. Uh, this is against the backdrop of COVID-19 and our exit from the EU. A fresh and more strategic approach has been adopted for this business plan to reflect the way we need to align the department um, in, a, in a much more joined up way. So in short, we want to be one team moving in one direction. The business planning process con commenced in December 2019 when officials uh, were asked to perform clean sheet thinking, to go right back to basics and say, what is it we want to do? And uh, then uh, we set about going, getting some key strategic priorities. Uh, common themes included climate change, sustainable agriculture, fisheries and food, waste management, thriving rural communities and health and wellbeing. And these were used as a basis for determining what the department, uh, key priorities of the department would be for the year ahead. Then, of course, COVID-19 happened and we had to focus on what must be done. So strategic uh, objectives have been designed to align with the purpose of the department and the relevant programme for government outcomes. They also cover the department's regulatory governance and resource management responsibilities. So the objectives are natural environment, to protect and enhance the natural environment now and for future generations. Economic growth, to enhance our food, forestry, fishery and farming sectors using efficient and environmentally sustainable models which support economic growth rural communities, to champion thriving rural communities that contribute to prosperity and well-being, and to be an exemplary organisation. And on that last point, it's worth focusing for a moment on the department. Um, in the last two years, our employee engagement index has increased by eight percentage points. And if, if people aren't familiar with that, it's just a way of measuring how uh, focused people are in the department. And that's against a trend of uh, much lower, in fact, not very little growth over the Northern Ireland Civil Service. We have 2,500 staff equipped with laptops and working remotely, and even prior to this, DARA led the way in the use of distributed technologies. So, for example, at the end of 2019, we had 1,500 video conferencing calls in one month. So, um, there's a number of, I suppose, key themes that come out through this, but one of them is this point about connection and how we use technology. So, we would have, for example, staff events every two weeks where we would have 900 people. Um, logging in, up to between 700 and 900 people, and the Minister has spoken at a number of those, and we get very real interaction. So it's trying to, again, f uh, work as a team, and I suppose I'm saying that to assure you that you can take confidence that the Department's working hard to try to improve its performance and, and, uh, and keep a high level of performance, as it, as it has done. The uh, priority is closely aligned to Programme for Government, as I've said, and our focus has not just been on the main outcome that we contribute to, which is outcome two. We live and work sustainably, protecting the environment. 
We have tried to work with, in partnership with, areas, with other areas of government as well. So, on food, we are committed to sustainable production of high-quality, safe, wholesome food, underpinned by high standards of animal, fish and plant health and welfare, robust traceability, strong environmental standards, protecting our natural capital, a skilled workforce, internationally recognised science and a vibrant rural community. And in this context, I just wanted to mention food security. Um, we need to supply secure supply lines for food that we bring into Northern Ireland from the UK, the EU and the rest of the world. And while we grow a lot of food here, uh, we rely on grain imports and have a network of supply into and out of our food chain that stretches across the world. And that's why we're developing this idea of a food observatory, which is to keep an eye on all of those different aspects to make sure they're working. And we'll work with DEFRA on that. It's also worth noting that the Northern Ireland food sector accounts for 32% of Northern Ireland manufacturing sales. But our food strategy goes way beyond that. Food will not be taken for granted <coughs> for at least a generation, and we must cherish it for the asset that it is, both for society and, 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 um, wider, uh, and in a wider international sense. It's also vital, however, not to overlook the importance of this opportunity to help address many of the long-term environmental and climate change challenges that we face. And this can be done by ensuring we put ourselves on a trajectory for green growth, where sustainability is at the heart of our economic recovery and the optimum outcomes are achieved in the future. And I suppose it's worth just mentioning the fact that the Minister made a, a key announcement on that yesterday, and it's a really welcome announcement. And I mean, just to give you an example, from, even from our own department, we have 55,000 um, commuter miles a day being saved as a result of people working from home. So it gives you a sense of it. It's a, a big cost saving, and it's a big saving for the environment. It equates to approximately 2 million miles saved over the first 35 days of lockdown, with a reduction of 445 tonnes of CO2 being added to the atmosphere, or not being added to the atmosphere. This would take 500 trees 40 years to absorb this level of CO2. So it just gives you a sense of what's possible. So by embracing and supporting changes to working more broadly across society, we'll be able to deliver many benefits not just for our staff and the citizens they serve, but to the environment as well. And of course, you know, a number of us have people who've come maybe back from London for a while or different uh, parts and uh, are working here, living here and working in London, but living here. So again, there's a lesson here about what we can do and we can make an, an, an advantage of Northern Ireland's uh, assets. So Green Growth will aim to de develop Northern Ireland as a strategic food zone strategic environment zone, a strategic energy zone and an agile working zone. And that's just a way of saying we have got really important assets here that we need to recognise and use and find a way <coughs> to, to grow them. And I know those are themes that the Minister covered. A partnership will be working, obviously, will be required to do that. And we have a strong history of partnership working with people from, from other departments, arm's length bodies, local councils, business organisations and sectors. And we'll continue with our engaging collaborative approach. We also need to build our global networks and engagement platforms across key policy areas, such as the environment, trade, education, science, and rural affairs. We, can learn, we must look outwards and learn from good practice. And Bonnie Norman and I were in a, a, a call recently uh, with some American um, contacts to see about how we can improve our research programme uh, in partnership with them. And that's something we've a long history of doing, but now with the technology, we can, go, we can do much more of that. <clears throat> so um, I suppose we'll be happy to talk through the 16 targets with you. Um, a total of 16 targets have been now identified as being key for the department in this financial year. And I suppose that just recognised the fact that with, with COVID, we had to be realistic about what is it we need to make sure must happen. It's not just about what we think should happen. And there are other targets that are held within group business plans that are still there. It's not that we're stopping anything, but what we're saying is we need to focus on these areas and really try uh, to make progress on them as we come out of COVID. So, as I said, we'll be happy to talk through the 16 targets with you. And it's worth noting they broadly cover the priorities I described earlier. Mm -hmm. and it's, not a pos it's not possible to apply a simple categorisation to targets like this because a lot of them are joined up. But I suppose it's worth saying almost half of them have an environmental focus, another half address issues on food, agriculture and fisheries. And there's a major focused objective on rural affairs which links and works with all of them, because all of the objectives have an important role in importing and supporting and developing rural communities. And importantly, rural communities will be central to delivering the, object, the other objectives. So all of this is happening as we transition to new arrangements following the UK's exit from the EU, and you can see um, that's one of the, a number of the targets re relate to that. 
So while this is a focused plan, it contains within a huge agenda for change. For each objective, there's a great deal of work underway or about to begin. And uh, as I say, there's more work going on underneath all of that. So um, thank you for listening to that initial opening remarks. I just wanted to give you a flavour of why we got to where we got to with the plan. And I'd be very happy to talk through, um, in whatever way you want, but very happy to talk, we'd be very happy to talk through the different objectives in the plan, if that works for you. Thank you. Uh, that was a very uh, helpful uh, overview um, of the, uh, the, the business plan. I suppose, um, again, it's almost touching on the briefing we just received earlier, um, a number of your targets, um, all of them, but in particular, certainly targets one to five, um, a lot of them, their fulfilment will be predicated upon the outcome of the Brexit negotiations and the transition phase. And at the last uh, briefing we received here, I think you indicated that the preparations were, were at an amber red stage at that stage. So, could you give us an assessment of, you know, the impact of, you know, as, as a res Mark researcher, as you said earlier, it's, you know, one of the challenges is what exactly are we preparing for? You know, obviously, we're not sure if it's going to be a comprehensive trade deal or a no deal. But how, how you know, how can, how can you plan to fulfil your targets in the absence of that uh, definitive knowledge as to where we will be in six months' time? Well, Norman can probably talk in a bit more detail, and for that matter, um, David could touch on some of the environment issues. Um, but I suppose we have we've taken a view um, right from the beginning that we work on a realistic worst-case scenario. So we work on the basis of what would happen if there weren't a trade deal and what sort of measures would we need to put in place. Um, but and, and I remember, actually, uh, this was something we talked about in terms of when we were doing the no-deal planning as well, where we just needed to make sure that we were trying to be ready for everything. And I suppose one of the challenges with that is it's trying to be ready for every outcome is both exhausting because you've got a lot of different alternatives to think about, but it, it's also uh, a recognition that some of the work we do hopefully would be unnecessary. I know it sounds odd, but you know you kind of need to do it anyway. So at the minute, our, our, you know, our, our scenario planning is based on the idea of if we don't end up with a deal, what do we need to do in those sort of circumstances? But again, hopefully we wouldn't need to do that. Um, the amount of work that's been going on, I mean, there's been a huge amount of work. I mean, we've touched the last time on some of the operational arrangements. <coughs> Pardon me. But um, apart from that, there's a huge amount of work around making sure that we've got a, a working rulebook, that we've got the legislation in place. So that might be a good way to start, Norman, if you want to say a little bit about where we are on that. Yeah, um, so there's <coughs> a big programme uh, of legislation, uh, and I think the committee may well have uh, had a, an indication of the, the scale of the task that does lie ahead. Uh, a lot of that, uh, some of that legislation uh, will be partly uh, predicated on the, uh, the, uh, the outcome of some of the discussions that are ongoing on the creation of the protocol. Um, some of those issues still have to be effectively negotiated within the joint committee. Uh, we're feeding into those processes uh, and uh, hopefully make uh, significant progress uh, over the summer. Um, but in many ways, the protocol, uh, whilst some of the detailed aspects of it uh, will be influenced by whether there's a, a free trade agreement or not, uh, the, the broad shape uh, is pretty well set uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the protocol and what we need to do uh, and, and we need to progress on uh, now to be ready to, to implement uh, and, and live, with, with, live with that. But also, I mean, you'll see in, in, um, in Target 1 there, we do talk about contingency planning. Um, and so we do need to think about what could happen uh, if we don't have uh, a free trade agreement with Europe. And therefore, that has to come into our thinking as well in terms of uh, looking at what the possibility, possible disruptions might be and to ensure that we do have plans to deal with those uh, if necessary. Uh, so it's, it's all part of our plan, uh, work plan over the, over the coming six months. And uh, before we move on, other members, um, what level of um, engagement or preparation have you had with the um, the sector in terms of pre preparing them for this? You know, like uh, again, I raised at the last briefing, um, the possibility, hopefully not, of exit declarations, for example, which would cost exporters, um, you know, quite challenging to co cover the the cost. Of that, for example, what level of preparation and engagement have you had with the, the sector uh, for the different scenarios? Norman, do you want to say? 
Yeah, I mean, it's just significant and it's, it's, it's ramping up uh, as we're now getting into some of the more detailed aspects uh, of all of this. So we have our Trade uh, and Agriculture Committee, which is obviously a key um, stakeholder group uh, where we have uh, the, the main food and agriculture and environmental interests around the table. Uh, and we can uh, discuss in detail some of the, the issues that now need to be resolved over the coming months. Um, uh, so, for example, issues around uh, what's a qualifying good uh, or what is on unfettered access. But in that context, what does the industry want it to be? Uh, and then we feed that in uh, then in, into Whitehall, because uh, these are the types of things that do need to be uh, addressed over the coming months. Uh, so, um, but also there will be a significant communications uh, uh, really will be ramping up uh, as we head towards the you know, I suppose the latter part of the summer into the autumn. Uh, from uh, both Whitehall and ourselves uh, in terms of preparing the industry for uh, what they will have to do come 1st of January. Uh, and so plans are, are uh, being advanced in terms of uh, making sure that uh, there is good communication. Um, I suppose part of it will be managing expectations. Um, there will be some issues that probably will be quite late in the day uh, before we have the definitive answer. Uh, other issues where we will know sooner. Uh, so it, it will be a rolling program. And, and as and when we uh, understand exactly what the implications are, we will be making sure that the industry <coughs> knows about it. But also <coughs> giving industry clear opportunities to actually seek to uh, influence uh, the agenda uh, to make sure that this, this works for them as, as best uh, it can. And Chairman, uh, I suppose I should add that in terms of fisheries, we, we are working with the fisheries industry in the same way as Norman describes with wider, wider agri-food, um, because it's important that we maintain that close engagement with the fisheries industry, um, who obviously have you know, expectations around Brexit. And in the same way as Norman suggests with agri-food industry, they will need to be prepared uh, to deal with whatever you know we, we face coming into 2021. Um, so we have already been engaging with the fisheries industry, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, David. I'll move around, John. Thank, thank you, Chair. And can I thank um, uh, Dennis, Norman, and David for the report before us, and comment briefly if I may that, that it's good to see such a positive report and forward-looking report in, in difficult circumstances that, that we know surround um, all of the teams that are working across the issues in DERA currently. So, so thanks to all of them. As well, and I ask that in addition to, to the 16 targets that are contained in the report, would it be possible going forward to build in further targets or sub targets or additional detail to the targets? I'm thinking, in particular, of green growth and the positive announcements made yesterday, <coughs> and the, the attention that's being paid currently to staycations, I think they're called. Um, and I'm very mindful that our, our uh, the package that DERA can offer in terms of the fisheries, inland fisheries infrastructure, <coughs> the forest parks are a very unattractive part of the overall NI tourist package and could be linked very easily to other tourist packages in these islands like waterways. So can that be examined as part of the economic growth um, and particularly the uh, rural economic growth as well? That's, uh, uh, that's Really, really good point um, through the chair. I mean, we, we have um, there's a bit of work has been launched by the uh, economy minister, and uh, she's working closely with the tourism industry. Um, Fiona McCandless, our deputy secretary, who's responsibility for well, a number of different areas, but including the forestry service, is on that and is working very closely. And the idea is, and I know David from the country park side mm -hmm. is also working on it. And again, with the angling side of things, people are working on this. So. It's, the, it's, it's early days, but you're, you're absolutely right. It's a really, really important opportunity because the chances are over the coming months, I mean, if you think about it, even from a personal point of view, everybody wants to go, to, you know, to try to do something different once mm -hmm. the relaxation hopefully keep continue, you know, depending on what happens um, with the public health aspects. But, <clears throat> and they're not going to be travelling abroad as much. So, you know, there's a real opportunity for people to rediscover some of the fantastic assets that are at their at their doorstep. Um, I mean, we already in the frost parks, we already have five million visitors per annum, but there's a real opportunity to do more. So, totally agree, it's, and, and we'd be very happy to to bring back more information on that as it as it is developed. Thank you, Thank you John. Um, Ray. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dennis and Norman and David. Um, excellent business plan. 
Of your 16 targets, which one do you see being the easiest, Matt? And uh, <laughs> one do you think would be the most difficult? It's when you ask a question like that so nicely. Uh, <laughs> it makes it more I mean, I think um, one, one of the things that characterises all of these targets is the fact that every single one of them um, relies on a lot, a number of factors that aren't entirely within our control. Um, so that that makes all of them uh, very challenging. Um, I suppose the most, for me, the, the one if we can get it to work the best, if we can get green growth to work well, that actually will make a lot of other things work well. And I, I think it's important to say um, when we t use that, I make a point when we use that term. There are two aspects to that. There's green and there's growth. Um, because actually it's about how do we get the business to work sustainably in a, in a more profitable way and at the same time have positive effects on the environment. So that's a real challenge um, to, get, to get everybody to see that. There's a lot of work we need to do to bring people with us so that people, because I suppose for too long now we've had people sort of seeing it as one or the other and it's about how do we bring that together. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm happy to take uh, votes from my colleagues as to which of them thinks the, is one of them the easiest. No, I, I was going, I'm them. not actually sure I can identify all, an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're all pretty tough and pretty challenging. You know, if, if you look at the range of our targets from Brexit and all the challenges around Brexit to something like climate change, I mean, just enormous challenges for not just for this department, but, but for Northern Ireland. Uh, so I would struggle, I think, Harry, to, find, to identify the easy one. I think they're all pretty challenging. <clears throat> And I think, Chair, I mean, as well as that, you th with your answers, there a lot of it as well are related to, you know, green growth, isn't it, Dick? You Absolutely, know? yeah. But, and I think your traffic light system is a good way of monitoring yeah. all, too. It's easy to see how you're getting on. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right, that. Um, Rosemary? Yeah, thank you again, gentlemen, for your presentation. Um, I want to just take a look at... What, in relation to you're looking at your targets and your environment and waste, etc., what sort of cooperation and discussions and talks do you have with the local councils? Well, How are you working with them to, for the benefits of both of you? Yeah. Uh, and David can talk in more detail, but what I would say is we, we've had a very close relationship over the years with the councils, mm -hmm. and not, not always a, um, an easy relationship, you know, they yeah. challenge us and we challenge them, but we all work together in partnership, and I have to say that's been very successful over the years, um, and uh, in recent times with COVID, I suppose it's just like the business community more generally, I mean, for example, today we have a, we have a meeting with a, basically everybody from farm to fork mm -hmm. is represented, and we have that once a week. Uh, or sorry, yes, once a week on a Wednesday, and uh, but we also have likewise a strategic waste partnership which involves the councils. And David, I don't know if you yeah. want to say something about yeah, how no, that work. Uh, yeah, no, I was going to just um, mention Dennis that we have engagement with the councils at different levels, Rosemary. So we have engagement at working level on a whole range of, of, of subject matter, but then as Dennis says, we have that engagement at, at strategic level um, through the, the Northern Ireland Strategic Waste Partnership. And that has really been strengthened, I suppose, through COVID, because we've had to work and build really strong relationships with the councils around waste, around re recycling and, and refuse collection and so on, um, through the COVID um, experience. And, and that has actually allowed us to really build a strong relationship. So I, probably at the moment, the relationship is stronger than it's ever been. And I think we'd like mm. to, to keep it like that. Uh, and on wider issues beyond just simply green growth, on, or, or sorry, recycling, on, on things like green growth, Great opportunities if we if we can continue to build that partnership with um, councils and really work collaboratively on on some of the green growth uh, aspirations. So I agree, it's very important that that we maintain those relationships, and I think we'd want to even build them, uh, make them stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, looking again at your rural policy framework and rural business and sustainability, what? What sort of partnership do you have with the Education Authority in relation to encouraging younger people, young people, to go in, go, go towards agricultural and agricultural positions within, and actually get back to farming? Anybody looks at a mart and you look at the age profile of 
a lot of our far a lot of our farmers. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to try and get more young people back to the land? Well, it's maybe worth talking about some of the opportunities coming out, just because they're on our minds around um, you know how we structure our how, how in the future funding is structured. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we've got a lot of work going on currently um, through CAFRI, and there is also through the rural development um, work. There's a lot of work with uh, young people, and um, I, I'm, I, I, to be honest with you. You've asked a really good question because I just need to check on the specific relationship with the education authorities and how that works. I mean, I know the relationships are there; it's definitely happening. But I just need to I need to check what the formal relationship is. But I think, in terms of more generally, the question about how we encourage people into farming at a young age. Maybe Norman might want to say a few words about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, CAFRI uh, obviously uh, it uh, takes yeah. a lot of uh, students uh, from um, well, from 16 to 18. Coming out, of, coming out of schools, so it has a good relationship with uh, with schools. Uh, through our knowledge uh, framework, we've been developing policy linkages uh, with the Department of the Economy, Department of Education, to ensure that we, at a policy level, we have that good uh, interaction in terms of what we're doing through our uh, education uh, offering uh, and how it links with uh, the broader policy agenda that's, that's uh, elsewhere within the, the education system. So we're trying to build all those links. CAFRI would have very good linkages into the uh, universities uh, mm. with the FE colleges. So at, at multiple levels, uh, we're, we're uh, creating all those linkages into the, uh, the, the, the wider education system. And of course, CAFRI uh, will be involved with schools in terms of careers days, and, um, and they will be doing a lot of promotion uh, of uh, what's available uh, at CAFRI and what CAFRI has to offer, but also what, what careers are available within agri-food. Uh, and there are some very good careers, uh, and, and CAFRI has some very good results in terms of people entering employment you know, within six months of, uh, of, of graduating from CAFRI. Uh, and those are very positive stories that CAFRI can then uh, use to actually promote uh, the industry and the opportunities within the industry. And then, and then I suppose back on the rural development side, there's been a lot of work going on around uh, with consultations involving various groups, and that certainly has involved education organisations. But mm -hmm. I think, in addition to that, um, it's uh, there. There, I think there's there's scope for more of that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's going to be absolutely crucial. It's, it's crucial generally, even in the programme for government. There's quite a bit about this idea of improving young people's confidence at an early age. Um, and uh, there's a crucial piece there about getting people involved, um, particularly from rural communities where they maybe don't have the same access uh, in some in some cases to um, some of the some of the educational other opportunities that mm -hmm. people living in the cities do. So there's something about how we make sure that that's, and again, technology gives us a huge scope there as well. Thank you, okay. um, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can I thank you very much for coming along, and I think. Green growth is a positive document, no doubt. Um, but, for instance, in Northern Ireland, we have high ammonia levels. I mean, I have constituents coming to me. One in particular just recently, uh, an old farm built in 40, 50 years up, wanted to replace a couple of them. Uh, one in particular is replacing. I mean, it's been months now with the planning service. Even though the, the, the existing tank was there, there was just a, just a change in roofing. NAA is looking reports. So, I mean, it's go through every hoop in the book, even though it's just replacing an existing building. And I mean, if that's not even growth, that's only sustaining what he has, and he's finding difficulty. I think we need to get to a place uh, where there is something in place that deals in a simpler way with issues like that. And especially, I think we need a strategy, we all know that, in relation to ammonia levels to try and deal with that. But, I mean, it is it is damning, and uh, not only growth but people trying to stay where they are in business. I think it it is an issue. I, I couldn't argue with that. It's def it's definitely it's a huge issue, and uh, the minister is very well aware of it, and is very keen to um, to to take an appropriate approach. Um, and there's work being developed at the minute, which uh, yeah. um, David and uh, Norman have been working on. Yeah. So I don't know, David, if you want to add. Yeah, anything. no, you're right, William. Ammonia is a massive challenge for for the agriculture sector uh, and for Northern Ireland generally. Um, and you know, if if I was honest, it's it's something I wish we we started working on years ago. Um, but we we now recognise the full extent of the challenge, and we have been working now for some time on trying to find a balanced approach so that we can set out a clear roadmap 
uh, for agriculture in terms of, of how agriculture can continue to grow um, and certainly sustain itself, yep. um, but at the same time find ways of managing the impact that that has on, on, through ammonia on, on our habitats. So ammonia levels are very, very high in Northern Ireland. Some of our sites are massively exceeded in terms of their critical load of ammonia. So we do need to do the work to find um, a, a strategy that takes us forward where over time we can reduce ammonia levels, but at that same time find a way of permitting what you describe, if we can, so that uh, agriculture isn't completely stifled, that uh, people can maintain their infrastructure, uh, and that farmers in, in, in the right circumstances can still continue to grow and develop. Um, but that is, that, is a, that is a difficult task, um, and finding that balance is, is, is what has been difficult. But we are at a pretty advanced stage now in terms of our internal considerations. We will be sitting down with the Minister and discussing options uh, for how we take all of that forward. Uh, I'm not going to say it's, it'll be easy, it will be difficult, but we are at a point now where I think it will, hopefully quite soon we'll be able to set out uh, a set of proposals around that. Especially where clearly there's no other impact. That, to me that makes common sense. I mean, I can understand that you build uh, big expansions and need to be looked at closer, but I mean, especially where there's, that's not the case. You know? I think in relation to trees and tree planting, the Minister... I think there needs to be a pragmatic approach, also to encourage farmers to plant trees for even on some land. I mean, I think in the past he wasn't able to claim single farm payment on that land. Um, no, if it was planted using uh, a rural development scheme, yeah. then it remained eligible for basic payment for the duration of the, the, the Pillar 2 scheme, so it was a 15-year mm. scheme. Then would remain eligible for 15 years. Okay. Was eligible. I think it's important that you know if you're going to encourage tree planting, you have to encourage it, not discourage it. You understand? Okay. Thank you, um, William Philip. Thanks, uh, Thanks for the presentation. I'm just going to ask a question that I asked of the minister yesterday in regard to uh, green growth. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the statement is very welcome, uh, and, and the aspirations are, are very good. Just in terms of the process. Uh, and, and even the committee's role uh, in the process. I mean, there's, there's targets, there's time frames, so there's coordination. So maybe just a wee bit more detail on some of that aspect and, and kind of the committee's involvement in, it, in the process. Well, I'm very, very happy to talk about that. I suppose the, the question, I mean, from, uh, from our point of view, this, this can only work if there's the broadest possible involvement. Um, and we're, we're going to use uh, all of the networks we have. We've talked about some of them already in terms of uh, you know, the business community, environmental uh, networks, and all of those, all of those contacts. We want, to we want to do two things, I suppose. One is we want to develop a strategy. So the environment strategy um, for the executive, which we, we had been working on anyway and had consulted mm. on and done a lot of work on that, will now become the green growth. That will be the, the strategy. And I suppose, um, again, really keen to have your input at every stage. So you, you will be in contact with a lot of different stakeholders, you know, open to any, any thoughts that you have. And it might be something that you can talk to the clerk about as well. So, you know, um, <clears throat> we'd, we'd be keen to come back at key points and say, here's, here's where we've got to in terms of the drafting of that. Um, and in addition to that, I suppose we're at the very, very early stages, but we also want to, uh, and the Minister will have talked about this, we want to look at a series of foundation programmes. And the idea is, uh, we call it sort of strategy by doing. So, you know, as we're doing it, as we're developing the actual strategy, we actually do some real things. So there's been some great examples of work done already. So some of the stuff around recycling, uh, so, you know, we can do much more around that. Um, you know, take a look at the energy, the renewable energy. There's there's scope around that, and particularly how we use renewable energy, particularly out, out of ours. Um, there's all the things that we want to work with the councils on, for example, to come back to the point that was made earlier about the councils, around um, how do we use smart technology to develop uh, new new ways of working in local areas. And the, some of the councils are really into that already. In fact, a lot of them are into that already. Um, so we want to see what, what sort of um, work can come out of that. And uh, then we, we're into the more traditional piece around habitat development, around land use. So for a good, good example of where you could have green growth is around how we map soil quality across Northern Ireland. 
because if we know soil quality and farmers are using nutrients appropriately, it's far more profitable and it also has a huge benefit in terms of some of those other problems that we've, we've talked about, such as ammonia. So um, there's, a, I mean, there's a massive amount there. It's almost be careful what you, you, know, what you wish for. Uh, um, but we'd be keen to work with the committee uh, to take your views at every stage on the, in the process on that. I don't know if that's, that's helpful. Thank you, um, Claire or Morris, are you still tuned in there? Do you want to come in on anything? Hello? Oh, Claire, do you want to come in on anything there? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm just for the, for the, the plan and the recording presentation. I think it's a really exciting attention time that, that we're in. But I want to I think I want to what look at it in a minute. And I think that it's, you're right to point out the environmental benefits of people working from home. But of course, they're not bringing other issues into play. So I'm wondering how any discussions happen with staff um, with regard to maybe any financial assistance that they might need to enable them to set up home offices. I know that you know giving them a laptop is one thing, but working from home has other unintended consequences. So if we're looking at this in the long term, um, have the department had any discussions with staff or with themselves to see if there's even like legal implications under more major rental agreements for people working from home, um, and will this type of step require onus on staff to be able to provide a home office environment in order to continue to secure their jobs? Yeah, that, um, I, I didn't. I didn't quite pick up all of that, but I think I got the gist of it. Yeah. And I, yeah. there's a couple of things I could maybe say. One thing is we've really, and I mean, it comes back to that point I made about the engagement score at the start. I mean, before all of this happened, we that's something we've put a lot of emphasis on. I mean, uh, my colleagues around me will know this is something that we look at, and it is it is analysed, and we look at it at every level. And part of that is about how we are communicating with people and listening to what they have to say in the department. Uh, and that's why it's gone up. Um, we have um, these meetings every two weeks. The purpose of that, to open it up, and it's never happened before, we just open it up to the whole department. So again, it's, it's amazing what you can do in an emergency situation because we realized people were suffering uh, in different ways. And we had a mixture of people. So we had some people whose work just disappeared overnight and we had to try and find other things that they could do. Uh, we have people who are isolated who find themselves maybe don't have family members with them. We have people who have had exactly the opposite problem because they've, uh, they've got maybe um, you know, caring responsibilities and possibly other people who have come home from England or elsewhere to them. So you've got a full range of personal issues um, uh, that, that do impact on um, people's ability to work. So first of all, we have, we, as I say, every two weeks, the fact it's happening this afternoon, and uh, one of my colleagues has, has been uh, doing that uh, because I'm here, but normally I would be at it myself. And uh, we do that every two weeks, and the format is very simple. Any questions or queries you have, the second thing then is you're absolutely right that what we've done is we've so far we've worked on the basis of an emergency and how do we get how do we keep things going in an emergency and as I say I just really want to I, I mean thank you thank you for giving me the opportunity because I meant to say this at the start I want to pay a huge tribute to all of my team including my colleagues who are here today because the work that they have done has been unbelievable to keep things going um, and people have worked huge hours and under hugely challenging circumstances. Um, yeah. But it does actually lead to, we, we haven't got all the answers yet uh, to all the questions you asked, but we certainly are supplying equipment. Um, a number of people took it on themselves actually and came in and got some of their equipment, some of their office equipment whenever they were moving. So they actually took chairs out and took you know some of the, some of the desks, um, desks out um, uh, from some of the offices, not, not large numbers. But again, we've, we've tried to use a flexible approach and treat people as adults. And I will say this, there's a really, really important point here. You treat people as adults and they respond as adults. And, you know, we haven't been directly managing people in the way that you could in a normal situation. You know, it's not, you know, that you're not necessarily seeing people. And it just, it, it never fails to amaze me how much gets done. And I see submissions coming up day in, day out. Um, and sometimes I wonder, because I'm, I'm probably one of the last 22 people in Dundold House, um, sort of, and, and I see the work coming in um, every day. So I, I think your point is really well made. We're working very closely with our colleagues in Department of Finance. 
um, because we won't be able to bring people back. Even when we get to stage five, we wouldn't have the space to be able to socially space and move everybody just back into the offices that they were in. So we're, we're going to have to do this very carefully and we're going to have to accept that part of, part of working now is going to be home working and that will have challenges, but it'll also have huge benefits as well if we get it right. So I don't know if that's helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's definitely something that's going to be a, a huge factor for everybody across all departments. But I want to maybe then go to the, the green growth strategy here. Um, and I think it's already been pointed out that, you know, uh, how do you be green and growth and, and the complicated nature that that is. And I've been looking into that as well. So, I, I mean, I'm, I, I would be really keen to hear of any evidence that you have that we can continue with this economic growth um, and how you, you know, that can't be separated from the environmental pressures and changes um, that we need to make anywhere near the scale required to tackle environmental breakdown. Um, and what discussions are have happened um, in terms of looking at increasing efficiency, which is one thing, but strategies to increase sufficiency is quite another. And have discussions happened about direct downsizing of production in many sectors, and agriculture being the most obvious, because you, you, your own figures show that agriculture is operating away beyond capacity, um, and that's really to meet export markets. I think they're sitting at about a rate of 80% at the minute. But to continue to talk about growth, um, we need to start looking at degrowth and sufficiency, and what kind of conversations or measures have been taken, if any, on that level. So I think again, it's it's not um, one one of the things we're trying to through the, sorry through the chair. One of the things we're trying to do is to tease this out a bit because um, when uh, even within the department, well, I'll answer your question a step at a time. Have there been discussions? I can assure you there've been some really good discussions um, because even within the department, we've had like a year of family therapy. If I'm being honest with you, uh, where all different aspects of the department have actually we're really trying to come together as a department for the first time as opposed to se separate business units. And I'm mean, sorry, my colleagues can correct me on any of this, but this is just a perception of me coming in two years ago. So we've really tried to work and, and get to the heart of this and say, actually, is it, all, is it always either or? And in a lot of cases, it's not. Because if you think about it, um, in terms of the industry, what is it the industry wants? The industry wants profit. It wants profitability. And that's not necessarily the same as numbers of animals in every single case. You can get better profits um, in some cases using a slightly different model. I'm not saying that's always the case, and I'm not trying to sugarcoat it and say that there's no that there are no tensions or trade-offs on, on occasion. But a big part of this is if we're looking at if we if we want to look at sectors where this has worked, there are sectors where where the market has driven because has driven us in this in a direction of greater efficiency. So if you take a look at renewable energy, for example, there's a great example of where where um, it makes sense, it's good business sense. Now you have to stimulate that and you have to find ways to support it, but we, we have seen how that can happen. Um, and it's not that there's not more to do. So it, it's not as simple, and, and I think on the agriculture bit, um, piece, I suppose just, it's, it is important to say that when you start to look at this in terms of the big picture, um, and I, don't, I think, I think there's, there's bigger questions to be asked about globally, what are we doing as well? because an awful lot of the rainforests have been cut down for agriculture. And the question is, if we can get it right here, and I, I don't say we've got it right at all, I think there's a huge amount of work to be done, but if we can get it right here where it makes sense, where farmers see that, uh, that actually as stewards of the environment, which they are, and many of them are, are proudly stewards of the environment, if we can get um, to a place where they see that role and they feel rewarded for that role and they can see it as part of their business model, and again, back to things like tourism is a good example of that, then this will take off. So it's not that we won't ever need regulation. It's not that there won't be people who do the wrong thing at times that we need to, to work with. Um, but it is about saying that if we can find ways to get markets aligned, because frankly, carbon is waste. Carbon is waste. If, if, if we're emitting carbon, that's a sign of waste. And waste is not good for business, however you cut it. Um, so that's, that's where we're coming from. So it's not a simple answer, um, I think. And I very much accept that there are real challenges and real contradic or not contradictions, but tensions in the middle of that. But we're, we're being open about it, and we're, having, um, and we're trying to find ways to, to navigate our way through that to, to get the best of all worlds 
um, as best we can. But to answer your simple question, we haven't had uh, discussions about reducing overall levels of production. Um, that's not. But but you know, I think that the ca the question is really. Um, how do we talk to stakeholders about getting more profitability into the system and at the same time doing, uh, you know, achieving environmental outcomes? I mean, Norman's got some great examples of that. I don't know if you want to talk about that, Norman. Or no, I just uh, going to comment. You know, green and growth don't have to be mutually exclusive, um, and you know, you have new green industries growing up uh, to actually tap into the opportunities from, you know, uh, looking uh, after the, the environment. Um, you know, within agriculture, we talk about productivity. Productivity effectively is about resource efficiency. It's using the inputs more efficiently. Using more efficiently, you have a much lower environmental footprint. Um, so you know, these things are not mutually exclusive. It's just maybe a slightly different language. Uh, using your waste better in a circular economy, um, you know, that is equally applicable to agriculture as to any other sector. Um, resource efficiency, if you don't pump something into the system that you don't need. You don't have to deal with the waste coming out the other end. Uh, so these are things that absolutely agriculture can uh, and, and will do going forward. But also, I think, you know, and coming back to the issue uh, you know, raised about uh, the, the level of our exports uh, that we have within uh, uh, agriculture here, I think it takes you into a much bigger question. We shouldn't be seeking to protect our environment by imposing a cost on somebody else's environment. Uh, and if we can produce quality food at a lower environmental footprint than somebody else, then surely that's something that we should seriously uh, consider doing. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's one world, uh, and we can't just simply shift the problems around. We need to tackle the problems and solve them. Uh, and I think that's very important. Uh, so there's that geographical aspect of it, but there's also the intergenerational aspect of it as well. You know, so if we do something to damage the environment today, you know, it could be the next generation that picks up the consequences. So you're into some very complex issues in all of this, but also it creates some exciting opportunities. Yeah. Um, and I think, like all things, if we put our minds to it um, and we invest in the, the science, the technology, changing what we do, you know, these are solvable problems. Okay, Claire. Um, okay, um, before we just conclude, then I want to I want to draw back to the, an issue that John actually raised, and I actually had planned to mention it myself as a question. But um, I, I do believe that the COVID COVID has presented an opportunity in terms of local home tourism right now, and I'm fully endorse that there completely. But I also think it's important that um, we actually really work very robustly to encourage people beyond the signature projects, beyond the big subject population, and right into very localised areas to experience those localised areas. And, and I'm aware from, again, in my own constituency, I'm sure they're shared everywhere, you know, there's a lot of people who have self-catering accommodation, Airbnbs, uh, little cottages that they've transformed, and these people are sole traders, and they um, have suffered huge losses in the last three and a half months. They didn't get any turnover Easter break, their weekends have, haven't been there, and they haven't really got any benefit from the <coughs> COVID funding because they're sole traders, you know. So I just think there's an opportunity there, you know, for a whole host of reasons to really robustly encourage, have a strategy that really encourages people into the corners of the country, maybe that they wouldn't have been before, you know, and, and try to give support to those uh, small businesses and the associated services that maybe got a um, benefit from people being in the area. I do note from the report we got, uh, Dennis, that the department has uh, established a tourism recovery advisory group, which feeds into the tourism yes. recovery steering group and working group, which is uh, located within D D DFE. So, uh, in terms of the, you know, who's on that group, Dennis, and what um, strategy is there a strategy to look at actually encouraging people? Because I think there's a wonderful opportunity now because people. Will be staying home this year, maybe more than ever. And, and if we can encourage people to do it this year, then you might set the trajectory for future years. This could become a long-term thing where they actually, well, gosh, you didn't realise that the Spurns or the Morns or or the Lakes were, were, were so good, and we'll go back there. You know, is, is there is there um, 
what's what's your plans there, Dennis? So Fiona, uh, Fiona chairs that group yep. from the Candlers. Um, unless unless of, uh, something's that's changed, Fiona. that's Fiona. that's my latest. Um, and Fiona chairs that group and has got people from across the department on it, mm -hmm. um, from all of the key areas, including, for example, people involved in the country parks and obviously our, uh, forestry services on her side. Um, so there is a, that's that's they're actually currently working on this at the minute to see what what can be done. Um, so there isn't a sort of a, a plan developed as yet, but they're they're working on it, mm. um, and um, I'm sure Fiona would be happy to, to talk uh, talk the committee mm. through that at some point whenever there's a um, a plan in place, if that's helpful. Yeah. And in the meantime, certainly I can take we can take back your your yeah. comments and, and make sure that that's fed into the process. That would be very helpful if that's mm. it absolutely feeds into all parts of the department, all parts I mean on the food side. Mm -hmm. Is feeding into that. Yes. Uh, yeah. The rural side is feeding into it. The environment side is feeding into it. The forests. I mean, we all have something to contribute mm -hmm. uh, to the the tourism part. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would absolutely agree. There's there's an opportunity here, um, and that feeds in. It obviously has to then uh, mesh with what the uh, economy are doing, mm -hmm. uh, so that there's an overall you know coordinated package here. But I think uh, I'd agree. There, there's a great opportunity here. To actually uh, expose what we have to our own population. Yeah, I expose the, the corners that people wouldn't have maybe yeah, been yeah. in before. Yeah, you know, absolutely. this could be the chance. And I think picking up on Rosemary's earlier as well. I think feeding into the local council's plans as well. You know, because they would have plans and strategies for think you know the what's an offer in their districts as well. I think I think that this is a really this, yeah absolutely. This this I think this is a really good opportunity for that now. I totally agree. We should strike when the iron's hot. It could be the one. Small server lining in a, in a very dark cloud that we've had for the last number of months. Okay. Absolutely. So um, I want to thank you very much for again attending today. Um, your um, presentation was very detailed and very informative, and questions taken uh, and answered thoroughly as always. So I want to thank you very much for attending, and no doubt we'll be in contact in uh, the near future again. So. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll move on now uh, to pages 77 and 78 in the pack. It's the sea fish industry um, fixed cost amendment scheme 2020. It's page, uh, it's the draft SR and memorandum is from the department of page 7986. You'll recall that the SL1 was considered by the committee on the 11th of June. At which stage the committee was content with the merits of the policy, the SR makes a minor amendment to the SR to SR 2020-76 to define the length overall of a fishing vessel, is subject to confirmative procedure by the Assembly Long State 2020-76, which the SSR now amends. The debate is an Assembly will cover both SRs. Can I I'm just going to put the question here that the Committee for Agriculture and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2025. The Sea Fish Industry Coronavirus Fixed Cost Amendment Scheme in Northern Ireland 2020 and recommends it be confirmed by the Assembly. Is the members okay with okay. that? Okay, uh, item 7 the direct payments to farmers, controls and checks amendment 2020. Uh, correspondence is at page 88 to 90 in your pack, and the, S the draft SR is at 91 to 93. Rule will be laid under the negative resolution procedure and will come into operation on the 20th July 2020. It's a minor amendment to the Commission implementing, uh, implementing Regulation EU. 809-2014, which lays down the rules for the application of EU regulations 1306-2013 in respect of the integrated administration and control system, rule development measures and cross-compliance for, for claim year 2020 due to situation caused by COVID. The amendment will provide derogations from these requirements and reduces the minimum rate of on-the-spot checks on the normal control rate for greening cross-compliance basic payment and young farmer scheme. Um, uh, if members, members any comment or are you okay with that? You can handle that. Okay. Okay, if that's moved to the next slide to the stage. Okay. Um, departmental written briefing on COVID-19. It's on pages uh, 90 to 112 in your pack. And if members have any questions on the update, they can forward them to the clerk by the close of play today. Okay, so you get your five minutes to get done. And can I uh, seek agreement to publish information on the committee's webpage and do a tweet? Okay. Uh, corresponds uh, index page 115, 116. Are members okay with the action to action the correspondence as proposed in the index sheet? Okay. Uh, can I get agreement to forward the response from the Education Committee on the issue of rural broadband, which the committee noted at the meeting on the 11th of June to the Rural Community Network for their information? 
Okay. Um, before we close, um, before we go into the close session, I want to ask members if any other business want to raise before we go into the close session. Okay. Okay. The next meeting of the committee will take place on Wednesday, first July, at three p.m. in the Senate Chamber of Parliament Buildings. So we're just going to move on now to the close session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.